my name is Sarah, um, and we're I'm going to discuss today um, prescribing for kids. Uh, I got a uh, after reading all of your questions, um, there seemed to be a really big interest in what tests and what normals I'm looking for for each age group. Um, so we're going to start with that first um, before moving on to some case studies and sort of how I adjust prescriptions um, to to suit um, each kid individually. So it's the hardest thing about testing kids, I think, is losing their attention. Um, so the first advice I give uh, when testing kids is to be prepared to, for, to perform all of your tests as soon as the patient sits down. So I try to avoid lengthy conversations with a caregiver or fussing about with equipment. I have everything so ready to go. As soon as a child is in the chair, either sitting on a parent uh, or caregiver's lap or by themselves, uh, you've got to just start testing straight away. Um, I get my team out the front to either send the questionnaire to the caregiver beforehand or even just to ask a few probing questions when making the appointment, like how, you, how come you've come in today? Is there something you're worried about or you want to speak to the doctor about? Have they had an eye test before? Um, if they have, has it been very successful or not? Um, are there any special considerations we should know about? Um, and this is when uh, kids with special needs sort of might come out um, or things like uh, might come out like dys dyslexia or, or we're concerned about school or something like that. As I walk in, I just say to the patient, I'm just going to start with some tests whilst I have little Johnny's attention. Um, and then I'll, I'll be asking some questions about why you're here and, and any concerns that you have, if that's okay. So just let the parent know um, what to expect so they're on board, um, but it is a lot easier just to start talking to the, um, to the patient straight away. Um, the questionnaire beforehand also covers all of the factors that may increase the risk of visual impairment. So these include, but are not limited to prematurity, any birth complications, um, any systemic or developmental conditions that the child has. Um, also a family history of eye conditions, which includes refractive errors. Remember a child with one or two myopic parents is at a higher risk of myopia. Um, this is also the case with strabismus. Um, it's not actually, interestingly enough, always the case with hyperopia, which is um, which is very interesting. Um, I address all my questions to the little one, and I get down on their level. My seat is quite low, and I get down on their level, um, and I look at them when I'm speaking to them, um, and when they're speaking to me, um, rather than fussing around with my equipment or writing or typing anything. Um, my first question is always, what's your name or how old are you, even though I know the answer to this. Um, this allows me to gauge their level of communication and to start a relationship with them. Uh, if they're older, I'll ask, what grade are you in? What subjects do you like? Just to start that relationship here where I'm broadcasting from, from Richmond um, in the UK. And so here we'd ask about football, particularly now with the World Cup, but we'd be asking about what football team we go for, all that kind of stuff. If the kid's a preschooler or younger, I always say, we're gonna test how strong your eyes are today. Um, and they say, are you pretty strong? Show me how strong you are. And I, and I do do this and I get them to do that, squeeze their little arms and say, get them giggling and get them excited and get them relaxed. So the best way um, to relax them is just to engage with them. Before, <clears throat> before they leave our care, we wanna be sure that they have healthy eyes. Um, and we want to make sure that they're seeing equally and that they're coordinating well together. So when they're really li little, I'm looking for the big stuff. Is the refraction within normal limits for their age? Is it equal between the eyes? Are there any major concerns with ocular anatomy? Um, are they straight? Are they interacting with their environment as we'd expect? And then as the child gets older, then my testing becomes more and more specific to include accommodations, stereopsis, and, and all of those sort of binocular division tests. We're going to go through the tests um, to perform for each age group. Um, but the most important thing is you want to plan. And you want to plan before the kid enters the room. So you know your testing flow um, and you know exactly what's coming next. So you don't have to really think too much um, or stop the test to think about where, where you're going next. Also though with kids, you wanna be really, really flexible. If something isn't working, move on. Even if it's really important, if it's retinoscopy and you think, I really need this answer, just move on, move on to something else. 
do something fun um, and then come either come back to it or keep in mind that you're, you're most likely or you are allowed to bring them back. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind that it, it's not um, make or break if you don't get the answer immediately. So we're going to start with the little ones. Um, and we'll keep coming back to this slide. There's a lot of information on this slide, but we will keep coming back to this slide. Um, I always start by lighting up a toy. Um, I have a couple of rubber finger puppets here, um, and I place them over my transluminator or my light, and it lights up their little face. Um, this is fun, and which is good. It builds a rapport with the kid. Um, also, because of the light, it gives me a Hirschberg, which is really invaluable. Um, I start with ocular motility, um, showing them the toy, moving it side to side, up and down. If you lose their focus halfway, that's right, just pause for a second and then get to redirect them and then keep going so you don't have to sort of keep starting from the middle. Um, and then sometimes even if they're a little bit older, I'll go woo and get them to look all the way around just for a little bit of fun because it always makes them smile. Um, I always do NPC on like at the end of motility because I figure why not? I've already got the equipment in my hand and ready. Um, and it's quite funny to sort of, as it's coming closer and closer, say, oh, he's gonna give you a kiss, he's gonna give you a kiss and then tap them on the end of the nose. I do it a couple of times, it relaxes them, also gives me a little bit more information. Um, so I think that that's a, a good sort of way to start a test. I have a few different things here. I have a little, as you can see up on the slide, um, this little one here has all lots of different, uh, very detailed um, pictures, which is quite handy. Um, and I have like little toys on sticks and things like that. So, but I've always got them handy and I can just keep sw switching over. Then I move straight to cover test um, because I've already got the stimulus in, in my hand. So whatever I've been doing um, motility with, I do cover test with. Um, I, I might, if I feel feel like they weren't interested or I've lost their attention, I might quickly switch over to something else. But I want to again have it sort of right on hand and not not take too much time looking for it. By this stage, the toddler, um, especially if they're a little older than you, all right, this lady's funny. What's she gonna do with this now? Which is good because um, I really need to get a good result um, on cover test. I really need them to be focusing. Um, so. At this point, they're thinking, all right, what's she going to do? What's she going to do? What's she going to do? And she's there watching the, the target really carefully, which is great. Um, I, uh, did, I do use my thumb um, in younger kids. Um, as you can see here, this isn't me, but it's a picture of, of someone um, doing cover tests uh, using their thumb. I think it's a lot less intrusive and I'm less likely to be pushed aside. I place my hand on their head and they're concentrating so much on my target. They often don't notice. Um, and then, uh, and but I do pop my hand on the head so they know that I'm there and that I'm and then I'm that my thumb is coming at least. Um, and then I just block the their visual access with my thumb. Um, once I've done cover test, then I'll quickly cover one eye fully and then the other, and then go back to the other one um, to see if I get a really big reaction. Uh, it may be that they just don't want their uh, my hand in front of their eye, and that is fine. Um, that's fair enough, uh, but it could indicate um, if they really react to one eye, it could indicate that that's because um, there's amblyopia. And so you're covering the good eye and they're thinking, oh no, what's she doing? Um, and so that's sort of something that is, will give you a few clues. So um, Brooke the next, I put down my transilluminator and I grab my direct op ophthalmoscope already assembled and ready to go. You want to be about sort of half a meter to a meter away um, and I usually say to the kids do you know how to have your photo taken and of course the uh, kids nowadays all say yes we're constantly taking photos of them I know who I am with my kids um, and they give a big wide smile and when they do most importantly they give big wide open eyes you want to dial in um, about plus one or keep it at Plano on your direct thermoscope and you look through the hole just like the picture here and observe the light um, red reflex coming back from the pupil. This just gives you some really big generative information. So the worst case scenario, if everything stopped here, they have to go away and come back, you've got some information to go on. 
Um, you can identify refractive errors sort of like in a, in a general way, it gives you an indication if there's a large asymmetry between the eyes. And it's also a really nifty way to pick up any media opacities or any um, strabismus that you hadn't noticed if it's a micro strabismus. So in number one and two here, you can see um, one bright whitish reflex coming back at you and one red one. Um, the little one has straight eyes, but a media opacity in the left eye. Um, and on number two, uh, that um, kid has a right esotropia. Now this is about 30 prism diopters, so you're gonna notice this one. Um, but if it's a little less noticeable, um, then it's really sort of handy for the microtropias or anything you haven't noticed yet. Um, in number three, four, and five, um, we're just showing you the different types of refractive errors. So hyperopia has a superior um, crescent, myopia gives an inferior crescent. And on number five, you can see there's a, a, an asymmetry is quite apparent between the two eyes. In number four, this kid has about, so I think a minus 11 and a minus 13 refractive error. Um, so you can see the higher the refractive error, the harder it is to pick up the reflex. So I'm thinking at the back of my mind, if the reflex looks a little bit flimsy, maybe this is quite a high refractive error. So at this point, I'm pretty happy. I know if I have strabismus, nystagmus, tracking issues, media opacities, um, possibly amblyopia, if they really reacted to me covering one eye, um, and I have a ballpark refractive error and asymmetry. I have an idea of what I'm looking at. If this is all I can get regarding refractive error, then no worries. I'll take a quick look through the pupil to rule out any major referral stuff, and then I'll bring them back if I feel like I need to. If they're pretty happy in the test so far, they're relaxed and they're still communicating and I've got their attention, then we'll move on to Mahindra retinoscopy. So the kid um, sitting in my chair is usually on mum or dad's lap unless they're really mature for their age. So get the parents to cover um, one of the eyes. Um, another thing that I do is when I'm holding um, my lens, um, oh, that's not a lens at all, it's not gonna help you. When I'm holding my lens, I can use these fingers to block off the other eye. Right. Um, you wanna be in near total darkness when you do Mahindra retinoscopy. Um, and I always give everyone the heads up, even if they're not verbal yet, they do understand you. Uh, so let them know, I'm just gonna turn the light down. Is that okay? Also gives mum and dad a heads up. Uh, realistically, I don't have total darkness, so I can see what I'm doing. Um, but don't forget to turn off your vision chart and your computer screen because they give off quite a lot of light. Um, I also turn those off before I start the test because I don't really need them with kids anyway. Uh, and the darkness is really just to encourage the baby or the infant or toddler to look at your retinoscope light. You're about 50 centimeters from the patient. Um, you can use loose lenses or a wet rack. Um, I think loose lenses are a little less intrusive. Um, if they push the lens away, then I show you uh, then with the lens on me and then them and then me and then them. Um, so they're a little bit more comfortable and they can see that I'm happy to do it as well. Um, as with all retinoscopy, um, you just change the lens until you get a neutral reflex. If there's a with reflex, um, and then you're adding plus. If there's an against reflex, then you're adding minus. Um, if there's astigmatism, use spherical lenses to neutralize each meridian, not um, cylindrical lenses, because remember you're in the dark. So it's um, hard to align the lenses correctly. This technique uh, also needs you to have a super organized trial lens set. Um, so you know that you're grabbing the correct lens. Um, so you need to be quite prepared. There's no time for cleaning lenses, all that kind of stuff. Once you have your neutral point um, to get to your final refractive error, you're going to subtract, subtract about plus 075 for kids if they're less than two years. One for kids who are about three or four and uh, one, two, five for kids that are older. So um, just say you, so you're at 50 centimeters, um, you neutralize the reflex at plus five. If the kid is 18 months old, you're thinking that's about a plus four, two, five. Um, if the kid is four years old, you're thinking that's about a plus four. So with that said, I start with the lens that I um, to be neutral for their age, thinking 
first off, is there a large with or against movement that's abnormal? So if there's six months, I'm going to just pop up a plus four. And ex I'm expecting something close to neutral, maybe a little bit, maybe some against. I'm certainly not expecting a really large width. Um, at one, I might pop up a plus three. And I should be kind of close to neutral, a little bit against. By the time they're four, they should be really close to neutral with my working distance lens of a one, two, five. So I pop up a one, two, five. If I get a really big width, then I'm thinking, okay, this is not normal. If I get a really big against, I'm thinking, okay, this is not normal. If it seems pretty okay, or even if it doesn't, I scan 180 then all the way around. And I'm just looking for significant astigmatism. So big changes from what I'm getting at, um, at, at 180 as I move across. Cross, so do I see a huge amount of astigmatism? Then I compare the other eye with the same lens to see if there's a big difference between the two eyes. If the reflex is close to neutral in both eyes and there's no significant astigmatism, I stop because who really cares if they're plus two or plus one seven five? I just want to know if the refractive area is healthy and if it's going to cause any issues. If in doubt, cycloplege. Every time, not an issue. Better to be safe than sorry. Um, I had an attendee question uh, that asked if we could use trapicamide. And look, if that's all you've got, then absolutely. <laughs> you just got to do, do what you've got to do. But keep in mind that it doesn't immobilize the accommodation in the same way. Um, I also had someone ask, uh, how old do I stop cycloplegiaing? Um, and look, I think if the kid can sit reliably um, looking at the distance path at target, then I, I, I don't cycloplege. Um, if I don't see any issues, if there's no symptoms, if they're just coming in for something routine, I don't see anything, my Mahindra comes back pretty acceptable, then, and I'm confident in my result, then I'm happy not to cycloplege, even if they're an infant. Um, but I will cycloplege a teenager if they think holding back on hyperopia that's significant. Um, I'll cycloplege if a parent is concerned about strabismus, if visual acuity doesn't match retinoscopy. So I'm getting like a minus one and they're reading 675. I'm thinking, well, that doesn't quite match up. Um, if they've got reduced stereopsis, uh, if accommodation seems to be fluctuating, um, or there's a large lead, which we will talk about in a second. Um, if refraction's unstable or visual acuity is unstable, sometimes they'll read 695 and then you come back to that line or say, oh, I can't see that anymore. Um, if there's significant anisometropia always, um, or if the child is being reported as sort of closing one eye when they're reading or, or winking or something like that. If you are going to um, cycloplege, just keep in mind when you're doing retinoscopy, you want to be looking at, at the central sort of three to four millimeters because there's a lot of peripheral aberrations. Um, and you want to ask the child to be looking at your light just to ensure you're right on the visual axis. If they've got strabismus, when you're doing the strabismic eye, you can get the parent to cover the non-strabismic eye just to ensure that that strabismic eye is, is focusing and fixating on your um, retina, retinoscope. So as you can see, children should be born with a small amount of hyperopia, which decreases over time to about sort of like 150 by the time they're four. Um, here I've just got the mean refractive error. Um, so there's a little bit of uh, leeway for either side. Um, in kids about zero to two years, the majority of emetropization is occurring. After two years, the amount of emetropization is not as clinically significant. Um, so keep that in mind um, when you're when you're prescribing and you're thinking I want to I want to leave a little bit for the kids to emetropize. They will they will a little bit, but not at the same to the same degree as, as between zero and two. In the early months, children are also more likely to have astigmatism and this tends to emetropize over the first two years. Um, don't be too concerned. The greater the astigmatism means the greater rate of reduction. Um, so don't be too concerned. Just keep monitoring and making sure that it's decreasing. Anisometropia also may be transient. So monitor if it's less than a diopter. Um, higher levels of anisometropia, so greater than three, they're less likely to be transient. So you, you want to, if you are going to monitor it, you want to be thinking, I, I'm, I'm probably going to be treating this soon. 
We had an attendee question about prescribing for aphasia or pseudoaphasia. Look, I'm not going to cover this in great detail, except to say, remember, you want to overcorrect by like two or three diopters um, because a kid's world is really at near. Um, and then you're going to reduce to a single vision intermediate ad, sort of like a one or 150 by the age of one. And then after two, you're prescribing the, a distance correction with a bifocal near to correct them there um, or to accommodate for their, their lack of uh, accommodation. Contact lenses are often the, the correction of choice here. If everything's going well, before I cycle, please, I will do visual acuity, um, but this is getting to be a really long test now. <laughs> so for a little person, this is a long time. So it may not be accurate, so keep that in mind. Um, also, keep in mind that you can always um, bring them back to do visual acuity and just before you cycloplegia at your next appointment. Um, so just gauge how the patient and the parent are feeling. Are they getting tired? Are they distracted? Um, I think it's a good idea to tell caregivers that a kid's test usually takes two to three visits. I like to set low expectations because if I get it done in one or two, then great, I'm amazing, I beat all expectations. Um, but if I have to bring them back two or three times, then the parents are not annoyed. They already knew that that was going to happen. So preferential looking is a great way to assess the pre-verbal or multi-disabled individuals. Um, it can overestimate visual acuity a little, so keep that in mind. Uh, the child shown to stimuli, a grading on one side and a gray and a gray side um, opposite. And there's varying sizes of grading, which go from very wide to very fine. So you start with the widest grating, that's gonna be your highest visual acuity. I spin or switch the cards around and flick them up. I usually make a noise, I just to get them to look in my direction. Um, and then I note where the child is looking to the left or to the right, and then I check the card myself. Keep randomly changing it from side to side. You don't want to always have it on the right or always have it on the left. When the child stops really showing a preference for the grading about the 75% or three quarters of the time, uh, you know that you they can't tell the difference. So you've reached their limit of visual resolution and, and you go up to the grading before um, to, to be their measurement of uh, visual acuity. When you say preferential looking, I always think teller acuity, um, but realistically, unless you're in a hospital setting, the odds of you having these cards are incredibly low. Um, this is me down the bottom here. Um, you don't want to be doing this with an audience. I was teaching, so you don't, but we generally, you don't want to be doing this with an audience. You don't want to um, distress the child. Um, also, try not to make any noise of movements that will help the child pick the correct side. Um, and you often have to keep reminding mum or dad also not to give them any clues. If you can't afford teleracuity, which you, know, you can't afford that kind of investment or you don't want to, part of the acuity um, tests are cheaper and there are really great alternatives. They use a familiar picture like a duck, for example, um, and a, a very similar procedure. There's a gray side and this duck that gets less and less clear to the child. Um, also, Picadoo Vision um, is an app. I have not used it, but I know it's an app that you can use on your iPad. So have a bit of a play with that. Um, the child touches the screen. Um, there's a gray side and, and a grading side. And they touch the screen. Um, also, there's Leah grading paddles. Um, they are going to set you back a little bit, but they're a little bit um, more recognized as grading acuity. Also be realistic, like I don't do this in practice um, because I don't really care for, for such a, a little tacker what the um, what the, the vision is. If I'm happy with the refractive error, I'm just gonna leave it at that. If I'm not happy with the refractive error, I'm, I'm going to correct it. Um, but these are options and this is how we would, if we had to, check the visual acuity of, of such a little kid. Um, and don't forget to check ocular health um, before they leave and pupils um, quickly. You don't want to miss any sort of big red flags that require an emergency referral. Um, for the sake of time, we're not going to go over those emergency referrals um, or those red flags. Um, they're the same in adults, um, pretty much. I check anterior health by holding up my 20 diopter lens from my BIO and um, to provide some magnification. And I use my ophthalmoscope, which I've already got in my hand, just to look at, at the um, at the anterior eye. 
Also, don't forget to just observe. There are milestone behaviours to look for in infants. And as a primary care professional, sometimes you're the first person to notice that they're not achieving something. And you're in a really good position in the community to refer on to the correct specialist or um, give uh, a patient or a patient's parents some, some resources, um, or even just to send them off to the kid's um, GP and say, look, something um, doesn't, doesn't seem um, like they're achieving um, a, a particular milestone. This is my general summary of what I'm looking for in each age group. Um, it includes vision and the tests that I do, but also um, hearing, um, language, motor skills, things like that. These uh, slides will be on, um, I'll send Lawrence a, an updated uh, version, but they'll be on side by side at the end of the lecture. So three to six years, we're going to do the same test basically, but um, where if the kids mature enough, then we'll shift closer to an adult method for each test. Um, we'll do a double H or an X for excursions. Um, I might use an occluder for cover tests. I shift uh, to static retinoscopy. Um, so they're looking at a distance target um, when I think that they're ready for that. Um, and with older kids, I'm more likely to use my retinoscopy racks as they're um, a lot quicker. I've got yeah, so these are my, so these are your retinoscopy racks. So they've got all the little lenses along here. So it's a lot, a lot easier than, than um, taking out a, a lens from your trial lens set. Um, I also add in MEM um, to test a combination. I'll switch up to the Leo symbols. Just a quick note on Hirschberg. I'm not going to go over this, but pupil rate reflexes give you an invaluable information. So take note of these during the first sort of test with your um, pen torch, the lit up to toy. So visual acuity for children, I use a LEA symbol chart. Uh, it's well researched. It's formatted in log bar progression so I can move it. Uh, I prefer a wall mounted one to a computer screen so I can get up and point to the object type that I want them to name. Um, you want to test this in great lighting, so no dim room. Start by showing them the symbols on a handheld chart, so something like this. Um, and look, they can call them whatever they like. Uh, like kids will probably call it a house. If you prompt them, say, oh, what do you live in? What has a roof? Oh, a house. Um, often as you get further down the test, they'll just start calling it a triangle. That's fine. To me, that is correct answer, that's just a, a naming error. Um, so uh, don't be too concerned as long as they're consistent, try to encourage mum or dad not to correct them. Um, I leave this with them to hold um, as a reference or if they get shy um, a little bit further down the chart or then they're pre verbal they can point to the um, shape that I'm pointing to. Um, I start with big symbols, I move down the chart, um, just one line at a time. When they start getting things wrong, I go up a couple and I do the whole line. Whether or not they get the answer correct, I am ridiculously encouraging. I'm bouncing around. Awesome, beautiful, that's great, woo. A colleague of mine says he can hear me from the room next door. I'm so loud. Um, so encourage the kids, even if they've got it wrong and try to encourage mum and dad to, to do the same. Observe the chart and not the patient. So take note if the patient's needing to squint and at what point they kind of shifted forward to do that. I use occluder glasses. So these are the ones that I've got, but they come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Sometimes I'll wear a pair to make them feel a little bit more comfortable. If they're shy, I might start binoculi uh, and then test one eye and the next. But I've learned over time that this game quickly becomes really boring for kids. So I don't want to get the visual acuity of just one eye. And so nowadays I usually straight jump straight into the um, occluder glasses. If they're wearing glasses, you just pop these um, over the top. If you're moving your chart or if it's not stuck to the wall, then um, just pop some masking tape on your floor so you know where you need to be standing. So when you're going to refer on visual acuity, this is, um, this is taken from the American Academy of Pediatrics. There are various versions, but they all have about sort of the same values, give or take. This is my little table down the bottom of a normal visual acuities that I'm thinking about at each stage, um, both in logmar and, and in meters. 
Um, accommodation should be like an adult by six months. So I do MEM or monocular estimation method. Um, some do re not retinoscopy, which I won't go through because honestly, I don't do it. But the theory behind not is very similar to MEM. Compared to just doing amplitude of accommodation, not an MEM allows me to objectively assess the accommodation and measure both the patient's lag and the lead. So I think that it gives me a lot more information. Against or any lead is abnormal. I'm thinking latent hyperopia, pseudomyopia, accommodative spasm, a lag of greater than plus one. I'm thinking I've undercorrected the hyperopia um, or not corrected it, lack of accommodative um, amplitude, reduced accommodative facility, things like that. Um, just on MPC, I'm um, just quickly two things that I, I like to think about um, when doing MPC is I like to do it with a non-accommodative target. So I start with my, my pen torch first. Um, and then if it's low, I'll move to an accommodative target. And if that's within normal, then I'm thinking, okay, accommodation is really dragging this, like really driving this patient's convergence. And so I'm, it gives me an idea of sort of what I want to test next when it comes to binocular vision. Um, secondly, don't rush the last 10 centimeters. Go really slow because um, you want to test the patient's ability to converge, but also if they can, can sustain that convergence. Um, by six years old, sometimes younger if the kids mature, I'm adding stereopsis and color vision. I'm also adding more binocular um, testing like ACA ratios. If I think there's an issue, suppression tests like worth four dot. Um, I might use a modified Thorington card or apprentice card to replace my cover test. Here in the UK, some might reach for their mallet unit. I'm not so confident in this as I wasn't trained here in Italy, but um, that's probably something you'll grab for. Um, there are also a really a couple of really great lectures on CyberSight that covers binocular vision testing. So go on um, after this and, and check those out. Stereopsis, here's some guidelines for sort of age normal for stereopsis. Most of us have stereopsis that requires a, a filter for the kid to wear. Um, and, but for those who have Lang and Frisbee, these can obviously be performed a lot earlier. They're not always as reliable, but they're but they, um, on younger kids. So keep that in mind. Um, in children with low vision, you want to investigate visual field, which a Leah one does well, and uh, contrast to the test like Hiding Heidi. Uh, there are some, again, some really great lectures on CyberSight covering low vision testing and working with kids with special needs and low vision. So go um, onto CyberSight and, and check that out. Lastly, checking, uh, testing children with special needs. Um, they can't be approached in the same way. If you're able to meet with the caregiver beforehand or send out a questionnaire, it's great to know more about your patient's condition before they come in. Ask extra history questions. Know what the child's routine is so you understand what the visual goals are from the parent's point of view and from the child's point of view. Um, also, are there things in the environment that they won't react to, like noise or bright lights or flashing lights? Um, how does the patient communicate? Do they already have glasses or have they had a previous eye exam? And how stressful was that? Um, because that might give you an idea if the child's gonna be really nervous. There's a lot of information out there on how to interact and communicate successfully with people with special needs. So I recommend if you're seeing a lot of kids with a particular special need like autism, ADHD, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, know what it's like for that child um, with that condition and how they communicate and, and things that are uh, that are common. Look uh, for people like Dr. Paul Constable, who is really interested in making eye tests accessible for people um, on the autism spectrum. Uh, people like um, Dr. Constable are doing a, a lot of, put out a lot of resources um, to help clinicians um, treat patients um, on that spectrum. So I had two questions from a lot of you. Um, can I have a drink? Sorry. What tips and tricks do you have for testing uncorroperative children? And how do you get the kids to wear their glasses? 
Um, for putting drops in successfully, I have a couple of stuffed toys, friendly toys. They're small, so they're just for little hands. Um, and they squeeze them. I tell them I, my friend Lexi, um, she's around here somewhere. Um, and she has a lot, she is very good at, at absorbing any nervous energy. So you squeeze her really hard. Um, on that note, loads of toys within reach. You want to be able to just grab them whenever you need them. Um, you want to minimize the amount of waiting in the waiting room. Um, and you want to minimize the amount of parental chatting at the beginning, which is what I mentioned at the start. Um, also explain what you're about to do. So for example, this is a light. I'm going to shine it on your hand, on the palm of your hand, so they're not too worried about it. Don't use words like scary or hurt or bright. Um, even if it's in the context of this won't be scary or this won't hurt or won't be bright, the kid doesn't hear the won't. They only hear the negative adjective. They only hear the bright. And so um, you'll get them um, immediately shutting down. Uh, for wearing glasses, parents need to understand the consequences of not wearing the glasses. A lot of parents come in and, and say, oh, well, you know, when he's a little bit more mature, um, we can pop him with some glasses. Um, which in some cases is the opposite of what I want. I want to get them early. Um, and then after their critical period, they can stop wearing their glasses. So um, you want to make sure the parent understands exactly why they're wearing the glasses. Also, think about how much you need to prescribe the glasses. Does the, gla does the kid need to wear them all the time? Because if not, telling them they need to wear them all the time could be quite daunting. Um, and could make it a little bit trickier to discipline as well. I think it's a lot easier for the kid if they don't have to wear them all the time, if the kid and the parent understand um, what specific tasks they do need them for, like reading or whenever you're at school. Um, it's a lot easier to discipline if they, if they have a specific task that they're supposed to have them on. Um, obviously, there are some kids that have to wear them 24-7. Um, so you tell them, you get up, you pop them on, you go to bed, you take them off. I think also make sure they're fitting comfortably. Um, there's lots of ways to strap um, these things onto, onto kids' heads and make sure the kid chooses um, the glasses and not the parent because they're unlikely to want to wear it then. Um, just briefly on compliance with patching, I think the patches that go over the glasses are more successful than the patches that stick to the face if they're older. Uh, the patches that stick to the face are, are good for young kids who don't understand what's going on and will try to pull the glasses off. Um, but uh, no one really actually wants anything stuck to their face. Let the child pick the patch, give really clear instructions, write a big R or a big L on the back of the patch. So um, it's as easy as possible. Again, be realistic on the amount of time you need the child to be wearing it. If you only need to wear them for two, it, you only need them to wear it for two hours then don't prescribe four. I can barely find two hours in my day to do something with my toddler. So you prescribing four hours is really daunting. And I'm more likely to say, you know what, let's just forget it for today. I give the kids a calendar. It's big. It's a big poster about sort of an A3 size. It has 31 squares for all the days in the month, like calendar. The kids pick which color they want. Um, and each day the kid colors in a square or draws a picture at the end of having their patch on or whilst they've got their patch on. And then at their review, they bring it in for me to look at. When they do, I spend a good five minutes really exploring it with them, making them feel special as they show me um, all the pictures that they drew. And this it turns the power struggle into something they have control over and something they might even be saying, oh, mum, our patch drawing, we've got to do that. And when mum's forgotten. So it really shifts the power um, to the kid. I'm not going to cover patching any further. Um, I don't know if we have a lecture on amblyopia. Um, if we don't, then, then on CyberSite we'll, we'll uh, address that. But if we do, then please check it out. It'll, um, I'm sure, be uh, give a lot of um, helpful information. These are my general rules for prescribing based on, on LEAP's um, publication from 2011. Not everyone fits into these, um, but they guide me of where I need to go. Um, in addition to refractive error, um, LEAP also asks us co to consider emotropization. So remember that is finished about school age. Um, so if you're gonna leave them a little undercorrected, 
at school, um, do so with the thought of will they be able to cope? Most kids that age can, um, rather than the thought of um, amateurization, it's, it's less of a concern by the time they're in school. Also keep in mind that if a kid's struggling at school, um, that outweighs any um, sort of myopia control or, or any um, amateurization. If they're not doing well, um, you want to correct them um, to, to ensure that they can see clearly and do everything that they need to do. So I am, as per usual, running, I'm going to end up running a little bit over time. Um, but what I want to do is, so I'm going to send these slides to um, to Lauren. So he'll have them um, up underneath my lecture on CyberSight. Um, and so there's some some sort of tips or things that I'm thinking about um, when it comes to optical um, correction in amblyopia. Your business, um, keep in mind that this is never normal. And you want to be thinking about sort of what is causing this. If it's an exotropia, like you want to be thinking, is the child going to grow out of this or is surgery, surgery required? Do I need to refer this kid? Um, and how long standing is it? Has it been here for a while or has something just happened where it started to break down? If it's an esotropia, is it accommodative? And if so, you want to check if the tropia can be eliminated by the full plus, and that'll tell you if it's accommodative. If the tropia isn't eliminated by full plus, then you know that it, it's a little bit more than just accommodative um, esotropia. Um, if it is eliminated, then you can try to reduce the um, prescription binocularly, so the same amount in each eye, um, making sure that you're still not detecting um, any movement, and then you would stop. If you started detecting movement, you'd go back up a step, or when you got to the, to the child's sort of age normal. Um, hyperopia, um, if there's strabismus, I get my kids to wear all their plus. Um, if there's no strabismus, no amblyopia, I'm inclined to prescribe a partial um, prescription up to their age. Um, what I want to make sure though, is if I am going to um, undercorrect um, hyperopia that I undercorrected by the same amount in each eye. Um, also, I'm thinking uh, if they're, like I said before, it can have some huge impacts on learning. And so at a time when they're meant to be developing a love for reading and writing, a long lifelong learning, if they're having issues with the hyperopia, you're better off to correct that um, straight away without, without too much concern um, for correcting the, the prescription fully. So I have this little packer, four years old, no glasses, no parental concerns, Psych cycloplegic shows um, hyperopic anisometropia. So we've got one to the five in the right eye, 350 in the left eye. But the visual acuities are equal and they're not far off what I expect for his age. So you're thinking, oh no, 695, but remember 695 for a four year old, that's pretty good. I produced the prescription in both eyes by the same amount to keep accommodative effort equal. Um, and look, he's still young, so I'm hoping if I just hold back that hyperopia just a little bit, he'll still ever tropeize, just maybe a touch more. Remember, not a whole lot, but just a touch more. Um, if the anisometropia is less than four diopters, I'm not I'm not going to reduce the anisometropia. I'm just going to fully, I'm just going to correct it. Um, I corrected this little one for two reasons, um, mainly because um, they were having a lot of issues. Um, with school. Um, when kids are at school, I ask them a lot of questions about reading. Even if they say, oh yeah, it's clear up close. They say, do you like reading? Are you a fast or slow reader? Because I'm a super slow reader. Um, do you read with your finger or your ruler? Do you lose your place sometimes or reread the same line sometimes? Are the letters clear all the time? Do the words ever move or jump around a little bit? Um, so I want lots and lots of information about sort of what it's like um, for this kid to, to um, read. Here I have a kiddo who's a little um, older um, and so it's going to be less happy if I give them all that plus. 
I did a subjective, which um, was a lot lower than the prescribed glasses, but at least I could improve the visual acuities and get quite good visual acuities. Um, the child also has been recently diagnosed with dyslexia. And um, when I did my test, I, I saw a four, either four or near. So I'm thinking, okay, accommodations high. They reported blur in the distance after reading. So I'm thinking, okay, accommodation's really high and then it's taking that accommodation time to relax. Um, and uh, you've also got a lead of accommodation on MEM. So on cycloplegia, we see a lot more hyperopia um, for the age and for her age than we expect. She isn't gonna wanna wear the full plus. Um, it's gonna be uncomfortable uncomfortable. In fact, she reports that she doesn't wear her current glasses um, all that much because she doesn't like um, the vision when she puts them on. So to what I've done is I've given her a prescription that's a little bit closer to what we got in her subjective refraction. So I know that she's quite comfortable with that. And then to assist with her vision at near, I've given her a plus 150 reading ad. Um, I prescribed a verifocal because she was not going to wear a bifocal um, for cosmetic reasons, even though she's 10, these kids know what they want. Um, and I left a little bit of residual of a plus 075 because at this point, her accommodation on MEM was about a, a small lag, a plus 025 lag, and that's fine, that's normal. So I don't need to correct it fully. Um, this is a really great success because after six months, she was no longer classified as um, having dyslexia. Dyslexia is a really, it's a very real concern and a very real diagnosis. But I find in a lot of cases, um, there's either been a misdiagnosis um, or um, maybe there's a binocular vision defect that's going alongside that dyslexia. So you just wanna make sure that these kids are refractively managed well um, at first. And so if they are going into um, dyslexia um, management of learning tasks and things like that, then they can be really successful in them. These kids I saw recently, um, so I have no follow-up yet, but I thought they were really interesting cases. Um, the first little boy, similar to our 10-year-old, um, except visual acuities were not great or even. Um, hyperopia is revealed to be much higher and cycloplegia is sort of about a plus eight. Um, this kid was also advised to wear full-time. I'm thinking about improving that little bit of amblyopia. Um, he is seven, so you're sort of close to the critical period, but you know, um, they, they did um, in the PD group do a study showing that you can still get a lot of success um, with older kids. So don't give up on, on an eye. Um, hopefully as we review him, he'll accept more of his hyperopic prescription in the distance and I can drop his reading ad. Um, I, he could read uh, 695 and then 6, uh, 12. So that was sort of the thing. He came in moderate hyperopia and that was really all I was getting on my ret. Um, but he was saying he would, he would read the 695 line and then say, oh no, I can't see that. So I knew as we were testing him, something was wrong. So that's why I cyclopleached him. Lucky I did. I cyclopleached his sister, who is the 14 year old um, on the right there. She reported vision as pretty good and loving to read, no issues, but my retinoscopy was a little higher. Um, and so we cycloed her. Um, I picked her ad based on a very focal. Um, so I left her a little undercorrected, but she sees all the four dots and worth four dots. So I know she's not suppressing with that ad and she doesn't have amblyopia. So I can afford to undercorrect her a little bit. And with time, we'll monitor how much plus she'll accept. So as they use the bifocal, the verifocal more and more, they'll relax a little bit more and more, and they'll hopefully accept more and more plus into their into their distance um, prescription, maybe even to the point where we can put them in a single vision lens. So we've got anisometropia here. We had a, a couple of questions um, about how to treat anisometropia. It can be treated in a number of ways. Um, corrective lenses are commonly used, but they, if it's greater than four diopters, then we've got a little, uh, a few issues and concerns about anisoconia. 
So the table um, here is taken from LEAP's recommendations in 2011. And I think that it's a really um, good uh, start when you're thinking about how am I gonna adjust this prescription for a kid with anisometropia. Um, if there's no amblyopia, no there's no amblyopia, um, and the anisometropia is greater than three diopters, um, and they're about one to three and a half, you want to prescribe the astigmatism and myopia and hyperopia according to their age, but consider reducing the higher eye by about a diopter. These are just a few things I'm thinking about when requesting lenses to be dispensed and these things that you guys, I know you're dealing with on a, on a daily basis. So this brings us to myopia and our last slide. Um, I had two questions uh, from attendees. One was uh, an eight-year-old boy with a plano right eye and a minus four left. Um, and the other one um, was a little kid with a minus nine in the right eye and a minus 050 in the left. I think myopia is trickier in one sense to deal with because we're so concerned as we should be about myopia um, progression. But we also have to think about correcting it in such a way that we're eliminating any of the amblyogenic risk factors um, that high anisometropia um, will will pose. And, and that takes priority. Um, I think one thing, though, um, one great thing that myopic anisometropia has going for it is that you can correct the myopic eye with orthokeratology. And this eliminates any issues with anisocronia and prism effects of magnification with, with lenses. Um, so in both of these cases, I'd put an ortho K lens on the myopic eye and leave the other eye um, uncorrected. Um, and I think the kids would really like that. I won't discuss myopia control. There's an entire lecture um, on this. In fact, it's an entire conference in and of itself, but there's an entire lecture on side by side on this. Um, also, I think myopia profile from fellow Australians, uh, Dr. Paul and Kate Gifford is an amazing resource. And I think Brian Holden Institute myopia calendar is a great, uh, sorry, calculator rather, is a great resource for showing um, parents um, how myopia control can um, have an effect on their kids' refraction. Um, I'm just going to finish with someone asked um, how early you would put a kid in contact lenses and can they sleep in them. Obviously, also keratology lenses they can sleep in. Um, I think if they're silicon hydrogel, I think that they don't need to um, if they're capable of taking them in and out. I'm happy if a kid can, can pop it, um, take it out, but they can't quite put them in if they need mum or dad's help. I'm fine with that. Um, all they're concerned about is if something happened and they need to take it out, that they have the ability to do that. Um, but if they need someone's help to pop it in, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, I think Air Optics Night and Day is great because it has a high DK on T, but it also has a smaller diameter of 13.8. But to be honest, as long as they fit properly, then I don't really care. I go for a silicon hydrogel and um, and, they're, and them fitting properly. That's sort of what I'm really what I'm really concerned about. Um, I'm happy to fit uh, kids in who are really young um, with auto K lenses um, and with uh, soft lenses, but I think um, you've just got to let your patient's readiness and the parent's readiness to sort of dictate also where you, you're going to go. I start talking about contact lenses really early, um, so they're already thinking, okay, this this might be something um, that we're thinking about in the in the near future. So that is it from me. I We should have some questions. So we've got a couple of things, how to measure accommodation and virgins in young kids who can't respond to subjective tests. Um, I, uh, I, I think MEM is really great or not retinoscopy is really great for measuring accommodation. Virgins, I think um, MPC is absolutely fine. Um, you might wanna do it um, a few times sort of over and over again. Um, just to make sure that you've got um, what you need. Also, know how what the distance is between the tips of your of your um, small finger and your thumb, um, because that's actually really helpful just to hold up to the kid, so you don't have to whip out a ruler or anything like that. Um, and as they sort of, sort of duck away, um, you're going to get a, a pretty um, good idea. Is Mahindra retinoscopy the same as 
streak right now speak? Um, that is a good question. Me hindu right now speak, streak right now speak. So streak right now speak, I'm always thinking um, about the um, the life of the retinoscope um, as opposed to retinoscopes that have a um, circular life. And um, so that's a really good question. <laughs> The hindroretinoscopy you, you want to be doing sort of in the dark and um and and about and the child looking at your retinoscope. But as far as I always understood is street retinoscopy just referred to the type of retinoscope that you had. Um but I am happy to be um I I'm happy to um stand corrected there. Do you do um Van Herrick? So I don't do Van Herrick. Um because I don't put them on the slit lamp all that often if they're really little. What I do do, and I took this out of my lecture because it just kept getting longer and longer, but I use um, a light just to check the angle. So if you, even if you Google um, checking anterior chamber depth with a pen torch, um, you'll find uh, a, a few examples of this. Um, if the iris lights up, then it gives you an, or if there's a shadow, it gives you an idea if it's closed or not. Um, so it is something that I do do because I have that light, that ophthalmoscope light in my hand. I'm checking with my 20 day off the lens and the light, and then I'll just quickly check from the side because I have it in my hand. Um, but I don't generally put them on the slit lamp and, unless I'm looking for something anterior, um, specifically if they've come in for like an allergy or, or an anterior concern. If you notice a small light turn, either EXO or ESO, when you're doing cover and uncover, at what diopter measurement would you refer or monitor and recall if there's not a family history of your business? So I would, if it's, if it's small, um, I think that I maybe, like you might even um, get the parent to monitor as well, like if they notice it um, at any stage. Uh, sometimes also you might get a parent coming in saying they notice it, but in your room, you're not seeing anything. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, parents are a really great resource. And so you want them to keep an eye on these things if you think that this is happening. Um, I would monitor if it's intermittent and small enough. I'd actually, um, so now that I'm sort of thinking about it, I'd also see if I can see if there's anything else causing it. So I'm going to do all my other tests and cycle cleage and all of that. And if it's like they might turn out to be a plus eight. And then in that case, I'm thinking, OK, well, I'm going to fix that. And then that's going to fix the little ESO that's coming up. Um, so do all the other tests first. I think your business um, often comes hand in hand with something else that's going on. So you just want to make sure that there's nothing sort of encouraging it. Um, if it's an exo. Um, trophia, then kids can grow out of that. And so I'll keep an eye on it. Um, but I certainly don't want them getting double vision or suppressing or anything like that. And, and that's the point that you want to send um, a kid off um, to, to get checked out. What happens if you reduce the sphere of cylinder visual acuity is decreased? Yeah, don't decrease visual acuity. <laughs> Definitely don't decrease visual acuity. Um, look, I think they, if they're um, the only reason I would reduce their prescription um, is either they're so young and there's, there's no strabismus or amblyopia, so I don't have to worry about that. And they're so young that um, I could maybe get quite a bit of emetropization out of it if I left them a little uncorrected. Um, or even if they're above two to four, I might still get an, enough. It's still at the back of my mind. I'm thinking, okay, that's something that could be happening. Um, but uh, at that case, in that case, also my visual acuities aren't that um, accurate, so I'm not going to really base my um, decisions on visual acuity. I'm going to base it on sort of my refractive knowledge. Um, if you've got a kid who is like 10, um, and by reducing the prescription, you're reducing visual acuity, then absolutely don't reduce it. Um, if you've got some uh, a kid that has really large um, astigmatism and you're worried by reducing the astigmatism, you might lower um, visual acuity, but you're also going to lower that discomfort. So I had a patient the other day who had fairly high um, astigmatism um, and myopia and had never worn glasses before. And so I 
I did, she was 12. So I gave her a partial correction um, for her astigmatism. And with the thought um, here at ANHS, if there's, a, if there's a change in prescription, they'll cover it. Um, and so with the thought of when she comes back and she's able to accept more of that astigmatism and she's adapted to wearing her new glasses, we can bump that up a little bit. Um, but the main thing is when I'm reducing the amount of correction, I always, unless I'm thinking about anisometropia specifically and reducing the difference between the two eyes, I want to make sure that I reduce it by the same amount in both eyes. So if I'm going to decrease this by plus one, I want to decrease this one by plus one. So accommodative efforts the same. How do you deal with a patient with anisotropia having very high hyperopia? That's a little, that's always really tricky, isn't it? That's always super tricky. Look, I think um, what I'm going to do is I'm thinking about how old this kid is. Yeah. I'm thinking about um, what, is there any amblyopia or anything like that? I want to make sure that they can see clearly. I want to make sure that, um, that they're using their eyes or developing their eyes binocularly as, as best as we can. Um, but if they've got a really large exotropia, um, then it, you also might send them off to an ophthalmologist to get that checked out and to see if they can straighten that and then you can um, correct the hyperopia. So um, work with your local ophthalmology team and ask them what they think that, they, that um, you should be doing and tell them what your thoughts are as well. And you sort of might compromise somewhere in the middle and co-manage with them. Yes, someone said, yeah, I think it's better to do MEM in a room with normal illumination. Um, yes, I agree. Did I not, did I put that, did it say, does it say something different? Does it say dim lighting? If it does, I apologize. Um, with um, monocular estimation method, yes, absolutely. You want, you want full lighting because they're reading the little card um, that's on your MEM, oh, that's on your retina scope. If you don't have one of those little cards, I also just hold up my, uh, like a, uh, my hold up, uh, like a, a little, um, um, oh, what do you call them? Like a little chart or something, um, or a little stick for them to read off, um, just sort of up right underneath my retina scope, by the way. Are there a role of spectacles in hypertropia or hypotropia? Um, I think hyper and hypotropia um, is a tr tricky one. You want to co-manage um, with your with your specialist there. Um, I think that you want to make sure that they're that they that the kids are corrected. But um, a hypertropia and a hypotropia is going to indicate um, that something else is is going on that's outside of that refraction. What's the best way to examine an albino kid? So um, this is. This is what someone's written. I think that that's, um, I think that's a really, I think if kids have um, albinism, you definitely check uh, Nicole Ross's lecture on cybersite. Um, she works with um, a lot of albinism and I think that um, you'll get a lot of, um, you'll get a, a lot of uh, good tips and tricks um, from, uh, from that lecture, you want to make sure those kids are, are wearing a hat. Um, things are very, very bright. Um, but also you want to make sure that they've got all the low vision devices that they need. Yeah. Um, in terms of psychoplegic assessments, how can you get the best or closest access for patients with astigmatism? Are there any tips? So I think that you should, um, be correcting with spheres. Um, because I think um, otherwise it's too tricky to, to hold up the lens. Um, I also think that like invest in like a pediatric trial frame uh, these things like uh, this one I think is on Amazon um, in the UK and it costs less than 20 pounds. Um, and it just means that you know that um, it's sitting properly um, and it's not falling down their nose or anything like that. So I think definitely invest in, in a small trial frame. Um, but and use um, spherical lenses to um, correct. I think that's a lot easier and it's a lot easier to get the axis correct as well. Um, also looking into that central sort of three to four millimeters um, of, the, of the pupil um, so you don't get too many um, aberrations. We have a lot of um, questions here and I'm gonna have a patient that's coming in soon. So I just wanted to wrap things up. Um, 
I am on CyberSight um, and as one of the mentors. Um, so um, any of the questions, um, any questions that you have that I haven't answered, um, please feel free to connect with um, the CyberSight team and they'll sign you up um, for that. Uh, service and and we can discuss um, kids at any stage <laughs> always happy to discuss um, uh, cases with people I'm really really glad that we could do this um, so thank you so much